विक्रम जी गुड आफ्टरनून या गुड आफ्टरनून सर वी कैन स्टार्ट द सेशन इट्स ऑल वेल या या वी कैन स्टार्ट इन अनदर थ्री मिनट्स ओके फाइन सो आर वी लाइव और इन द ऑडिटोरियम या या वी आर लाइव नाउ ओके Okay, Mr. Uh, Vikram, should we begin? Should we begin? Yes, Abhi. Good to start. Okay, fine. Uh, very good afternoon and warm welcome to the parallel session on the theme, socio-technological transformation and future earth, theories and applications. Let me have the pleasure of introducing the session chair, distinguished Dr. Smriti Basnet. Dr. Basnet is associated as deputy director at. Divecha Center for Climate Change of Future Earth Global Secretariat Hub, South Asia, located in Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. She manages and directs programs for South Asia, pushing for the spousal of the sustainable development goals in national and regional policies. Dr. Basnet is currently working to establish working groups and committees on food security, water security, clean air, and health in South Asia for future earth. I would request Dr. Basnet to take over and chair the session. In this current session, we have three presenters, Dr. Wood Mohan from Myanmar, Dr. Anindita Sarkar from University of Delhi, and Mr. Manjunath KV from Karnal. It's all over to you, Dr. Basnet. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Nitin. Thank you to all the organizers. And I would like to also thank the organizers for allowing Future Earth to be a part of SCA and also to chair this session. So for many, I would just like to introduce Future Earth, which uh, Nitin has already done. So together, Future Earth, we promote global sustainability through its distributed secretaries, which function as global hubs in Canada, Sweden, France, and in Asia, we have it in Taipei, Japan, China, and South Asia. Every year, Future Earth has been organizing sessions for SCA, and we are very thankful to the organizers for having us again with you. I will not talk much, but I would like uh, to again introduce our first speaker for today, that's Dr. Wood. So we'll design it in such a way and we will plan a program uh, where I want to give around 20 minutes to each of the speakers. And I look forward to a very interactive session as well. So uh, uh, Dr. Wood is, uh, our, uh, next, is our first speaker. She's a lecturer at, the, lecturer at the Department of Physics in the Dawei University of Myanmar. So she's going to talk about study and analysis of wind, solar, energy resources in the coastal area of southern Myanmar and how technology is helping advance society in this region of the world. So to you, Dr. Wood. Yes. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. May I share a slide? Yes. Uh, okay. So, yeah, Dr. Wood, you can take 20 minutes because yeah. we have only three yes. yes. Good, af good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Dr. Wood Mo'u. I'm lecturer from the Department of Physics to a university in the Nindai region of Myanmar. Today, the topics I would like to present is study and analysis of wind, solar, hybrid energy resources in coastal area of southern Myanmar. Now, I would like to talk about the extract. This, uh, the research is to study on two sources of wind, solar, renewable energy. Our first purpose is to supply clean electricity for coastal region without environmental impact of pollution. Uh, the study area is the Nindai region, which lies on the southern part of Myanmar in north latitude 30 degree and east latitude 98 degree 45 minutes. The Nindai region is the lowest availability of the electricity in Myanmar. Uh, this paper is represented the analysis of the annual average and maximum wind speed data at different heights and sunshine hours from meteorological observation at two weather stations such as Dewar City and Laulang Township. According to the recorded data, the hybrid system will be able to solve the demand of electricity for most of the rural areas of which are not yet connected in national grid. At present, uh, the price of electricity in those regions is uh, five times higher than those other cities in Myanmar. The design system is intended to reduce the cost of supplying electricity in regional programs. The system consists of two operation modes, they are real-time mode and switching mode. Real-time mode can be used for constant weather condition and switching mode is suitable for instantly changing weather condition, especially for coastal region. The continuous electricity from the hybrid power system will be controlled by the microcontroller. The hybrid technique will be applied to be the best option to achieve continuous local electrical power source for sustainable development. This figure shows the location map of the Tanindai coastal area, it is long, narrow, and is about uh, 200 kilometers north uh, to the mouth of the Motamat and to the mouth of the Pachan River in the Bay of the Bagay and in the Ajaman Sea. So uh, renewable energy sources are plentiful in those regions. Uh, wind, uh, wind speed is well enough and the light industry is very strong because it has near the equator. I want to talk about the introduction. Uh, 
The system two sources will be used in this research wash to generate electricity for household application, especially in the Nidayu region. In wind solar hybrid system, solar panel directly converts solar radiation into electrical energy and wind turbine converts kinetic energy for the wind into mechanical power. As per annual data recorded from regional department of meteorology and hydrology, both the sunshine hours and maximum wind speed in the Nidayu region are high compared to that of the other cities in Myanmar. Uh, I want to discuss wind and solar renewable energy sources in coastal region. The way the capital of the Nidayu region is uh, located between north latitude 40 degrees 4 minutes and east longitude. 98 degree 11 minutes. Monthly sunshine hours, uh, monthly measurement, and average monthly wind speed data for 2019 to 2021 are obtained from meteorological station in Taiwan. Wind speed has been recorded four times a day at 6.30 a.m., 9.30 a.m., 12.30 p.m., and 8.30 p.m. Highest wind speed are usually observed at 9.30 a.m. and 8.30 p.m. for each month. Wind speed data and sunshine hours are measured at a height of 33 feet by using anemometer and sunshine recorder. Uh, the other study on focus area is Laolong Township, a situated one of the Dewa district, the Nizayu region, and the elevation sea level is about 150 feet. Monthly sunshine hours, monthly measurement, and average monthly wind speed at a height of 10 feet are listed from 2019 to 2021 to in Lolo weather station. The other study area is Lake, uh, a coastal town in the Nizayan region in Myanmar, located in the southernmost part of the country on the offshore island of the Ataman Sea. Monthly measurement and average monthly winds be at a height of 10 feet are collected from 2019 to 2021 in Lake Station, as the sunshine recorder is now installed in Lake weather station. This figure shows the photograph of the animal meter and this one is the sunshine recorder. Here are some facts about monthly measurement wind speed and average monthly wind speed are shown on the cloud. Uh, the measurement wind speed in 2019 is 4.11 meter per second or 9.2 mile per hour and 2020 is 5.01 meter per second or 11.5 mile per hour and uh, the highest wind speed in 2021 is our 6.17 meter per second or uh, 30.8 mile per hour. Interesting first we our uh, wind speed increases year by year. Similarly, uh, you can see uh, the highest wind speeds for three years as low low station. Uh, those price are uh, uh, 3.65 meter per second and 4.065 uh, meter per second or uh, 5.01 meter per second. The highest uh, wind speed can be observed in uh, February 2021. Uh, the average monthly wind speed distribution is fair throughout for three years. Uh, this figure shows a monthly maximum wind speed and average monthly wind speed at May station according to the graph 2020 and 2021 in wind speed are the same. Uh, the highest wind speed in 2019 is 6.17 meter per second or 38 miles per hour. Here are uh, interesting facts on the graph. Uh, at least uh, average monthly wind speed are uh, uh, 1.74 meter per second and 2 meter per second or 2.2 meter per second. Uh, this table shows the sunshine hours and monthly measurement hours. Uh, according to the cloud, uh, uh, sunshine hours left from June to September, but uh, the kinetic energy of wind flow is very strong during the rainy season. This table shows uh, maximum sunshine hours and uh, maximum temperature at low low station. Uh, uh, you can see uh, previous from the table, it said the rainy period, it is sunny over the course of the year. I would like to deal with application of the hybrid power control system. Uh, in this design, the hybrid control system is based on 80 mega 3 to 8 microcontroller. There are two types of power plants, uh, wind power plant and solar power plant. 
the two power plants are combined with a microcontroller and managed for real-time control and higher voltage control. In this case, uh, the real-time control system can be used to operate for each circuit in day and night rule of the year. In higher voltage control, it only operates uh, with higher power source by reading the voltage firstly and then switching the voltage given by higher power plants. Uh, this figure shows the block diagram of the wind solar hybrid power control system. Uh, the control system consists of nine main parts. Uh, the first one is microcontroller. Uh, it is the brain function of the system. The second one is the switching circuit. It is the most important part of the system. There are two types of power plants, wind power plant and solar power plant. And then other one is the charge controller and the next one is storage unit. And uh, this one is cross module. And the other one is operation mode control input. And then the last will be the LCD display unit uh, or the various function display on the screen. I would like to deal with section circuits for hybrid solar control system. There are two types of relay control pins, uh, relay for wind power plant and relay for solar power pins. The relay are used to switch the connection between the storage battery and power plants. The common pin of each relays are connected with the solar power plants and wind power plants. Uh, there are three control switches on the circuit. Uh, they are connected with three digital pins on the microcontroller. In the present, uh, only one impulse is used to change the operation mode between real-time control and higher voltage control. Uh, the operation period predefined for the solar power plant is within a period starting for 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, if it's not within the PD5 periods, the operation of wind power plant will be operated. Uh, this figure shows the flow chart diagram of the rear type control program. In rear type control program, the rear type data can decide both day or night and seasonal periods of map within a year. This figure shows the flow chart diagram of the higher voltage control program. I will explain the control program following slide. If the time is between 8 and 7D, the system will change the solar power plant automatically. Uh, the switching on power plant is displayed on the screen. Uh, so to be able to use effectively higher power source, the manual selection of either higher voltage control from rear type control operation mode or rear type control from higher voltage control operation mode is required after reading the voltage. Uh, this figure shows the photograph of the hybrid power controller circuits. Uh, the controller circuits consists of four pairs of green terminals. Uh, the first terminal will connect to the wind power plant, and uh, the second terminal will connect solar power plants, and then uh, the other terminal will connect storage battery, and the other uh, connect charge controller. The final part is result and discussion. If the power output of wind power plant is higher than input from the other power plant, then the relay will operate. If the power output of solar power plant is higher than input from the other power plant, then the solar relay will operate. The voltage of uh, each power plant and battery shows low goals. Since uh, no power plant and battery are connected on the switching circuit, uh, the simulation carry out nearly 10 hours between eight and 70 hours in a sunny day. In this design, at the solar voltage was recognized at the first priority charging mode from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. and the wind charging mode will start a working after solar charging down. Since the availability of voltage from solar and wind sources depend on weather condition, the switching mode uh, need to be manually changed in the hybrid controller circuit. According to the results of the proposed results and the above data information shown in the chart and data, a monthly maximum wind speed of 5.01 meter per second and 6.17 meter per second, respectively, as shown in figure 4, 6, and 8. As cost region, the kinetic energy of wind so is high during the rainy season and it's like the sunshine hours from June to September. Monthly sunshine hours and maximum temperature are the longest periods and brightest for the rest of the month, as illustrated in table one and table two. The study and analysis of wind solar hybrid resources is intended to facilitate and to achieve sustainable electrical power source for rural community in coastal area of the nation. 
uh, to identify weight and solar energy production, high quality weight measurement data is necessary. Analysis data of wind speed and sunshine hours are important for wind solar hybrid energy application. Solar panel will not be able to produce energy due to limited daylight hours. On the other hand, uh, wind turbine can also be produced energy at all hours of the day when the wind is pleasant. In such region, the condition of wind and solar power will be power complement of each other uh, according to the seasonal and year to year variations of the weather condition occur. Uh, the availability of the electricity in the Nizayu region is only 10.7%, the lowest in Myanmar. Uh, using the application of wind solar hybrid uh, renewable system as well as resource, uh, is the best solution for a remote area in the coastal region of southern Myanmar that is stay far away from the access of electricity. There is acknowledgement, there is my reference. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Wu. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, but I, I wanted to have a good interaction with the speakers also before you spoke. So a few questions for you. Um, yes, do you have questions? Yes, first regarding, sorry, I forgot to introduce you to the speakers and I also wanted an introduction from you. So um, according to your designation, you're a lecturer at the Department of Physics, right? Yes. Yes. What is it that you teach there? Uh, I teach physics specialization. Uh -huh. And are you right now based in Myanmar? You're speaking from there? Yes. Okay. Okay. Lovely to know that. I wanted to know, is this a part of your university project, which is also done by the students? Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, this is a school project. It's a university project, am I right? Yeah, yes, a uh, university project for school projects. Uh, and uh, we need to uh, plan out uh, <clears throat> plan out for a hybrid system uh, for a local areas. Uh, at present, we have study and uh, data and analysis for uh, uh, wind speed and uh, sunshine hours and uh, plan of our hybrid system for local areas. Yeah. So are you experimenting it first in the university or have you put it in place in the coastal area that is in Tanintari? Have you placed your instruments there? Yes. You have already placed your instruments in the region? Because I missed that picture. I just saw the uh i uh <clears throat> as study at present uh, uh we have uh study and analyze the data uh, and carry out this project uh a future yes okay okay so just out of curiosity what is the cost of one of your hybrid power units if, uh, if, uh, Got a uh, got weather condition, uh, the hybrid power uh, will be reliable. Can you repeat uh, again? Yeah. If a uh, got weather condition, a uh, hybrid power system will be available for a local area. Uh, and uh, this cost, uh, the electricity, the price of electricity will be able to reduce uh, this area. No, I was asking the cost of your instrument and the tool that you have built. What was the cost that was incurred uh, building this, for building this instrument? Uh, I, I will construct the controller circuit. Uh, no, the construction of the solar panel and uh, wind turbine. Yeah. All right, all right. Yes. Uh, all right, so just wanted to know, so you in your figure, you said that uh, during monsoon season, there is less of sunshine hours. Uh, yes. Yeah, so the nighttime is not an issue, so you do have good wind speed there. Yeah. Oh. Uh, all the time is not got wind, uh, but uh, as the coastal region, 
uh, suddenly changing weather uh, that in higher power control source, uh, I can press uh, the switch. Yes. And when are you planning to put this on ground so that the community can benefit from it? When do you... Uh, I believe uh, this, uh, uh, the, uh, I believe that uh, the hybrid system controller circuit will be uh, advantageous for the local areas, yes. When are you planning to put it in place? Uh, yes, uh, I will connect the local government and uh, uh, to support, uh, to, to my support uh, this project for planning. So is the government of Myanmar also supporting you or is this a uh, universal? Uh, yeah. if, if supporting you, uh, uh, I, uh, this is the support for the university advantages, yes. All right, good luck for your research on this. Yes, thank you, sir. We will, yeah, I'm Smriti. So we will continue to talk. If there are also questions from the speakers to you, we will take that at the end of the third speaker. So with that, we will mo move to our next speaker. Yeah, uh, okay. So we can, I think we are on time. So we can take 20 minutes for the next speaker as well. A uh, pleasure, in fact, to introduce Dr. Anandita Sarkar, Associate Professor from Department of Geography from the University of Delhi. And uh, we did have Dr. Wood talk about how technology is helping advance society in terms of the needs, you know, uh, for to make it affordable for public and society at large. And here I'm looking forward to Dr. Anandita Sarkar's uh, um, presentation, where we see technology as a hindrance in some kind, and how technology in a way also deteriorates societal values. So I call Dr. Anandita Sarkar to present her work. Uh, good afternoon. Can I share my screen? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon. Um, so today uh, we know in the conference we are uh, talking about science, technology and social science research. So my paper will be a little different from the first paper. Uh, and uh, I will introduce my topic. It's water technology and water commercialization, creating new waterscapes and contesting cultural norms. So, um, I mean, I would not say that it has deteriorated cultural uh, values, but I would definitely say it is. it has changed. And uh, we are uh, seeing new changes. Uh, some, some changes are good. Some changes, I would say, uh, can be questioned. So uh, the picture that I have put here is from my field work. So this is from uh, the work that I am going to share with you is a primary work both quantitative and qualitative, mostly through ethnographic research. So you see, we, I'm, I'm going to talk about the water technology, that is the tanker technology that has now uh, quite pervasive in the rural uh, areas of Western India. And here my study is in Western Rajasthan. So uh, we see these, um, we, we always picturize when we say water technology and women, we see women carrying uh, uh, carrying water on our head, walking through long distances. Uh, and this is a typical picture that I have shown. But this is now replaced by these tankers that carry water to the doorsteps. So uh, this will be my uh, presentation. So I will just uh, move ahead with it. So in the background, I want to emphasize that Western Rajasthan, uh, I am introducing the area because it's an international conference. Uh, for all my colleagues to understand that Western India has water scarcity because it is drought prone with very scanty rainfall and high rainfall variability. As a result of it, what surface water bodies are dry drying up. And because of excessive groundwater uh, draft, overdraft, there is contamination of groundwater sources. 
traditional water harvesting structures are also drying up because of a lack of maintenance. And here I have given two pictures that are, this is on from my field. The, the, the one at the bottom is a cardine, which is a traditional water harvesting structure. The other one are the new tankers that are the emerging water technology in the villages of Western Rajasthan. Uh, now I talk about uh, women and techno water technology. So we all know that what fetching water is women's affair. And uh, women are good when they fetch water uh, for their families because water fetching water is in the domain of domestic work and hence it is bound by gendered roles. And women for generations in all kinds of cultures have been carrying water and fetching water for their families. And there are enormous studies which talk about the drudgery of uh, fetching water by women, uh, the lack of um, time for other activities. Uh, generally, uh, fetching water doesn't lead to her well being because she loses on other paid employment, uh, double burden, labor, uh, you know, working for the family, working outside. In a way, wherever there are water scarcities and women have to walk long distances, carry heavy load of water, her well-being is not taken care of. So um, my question is that will this water, has this water technology uh, become a solution? Can water tanker technologies become a solution to for her uh, well-being? Is water scarcity taken care of? So uh, we see commercialization of drinking water is now quite prevalent by using private tankers and they are carrying water to the interior villages in Western Rajasthan and giving door to door service. So that is true that women are, uh, some uh, women do not have to go to the water sources to carry heavy loads of water. Uh, but now in this, it, it looks very simple that now you have a technology and hence the well-being of women are taken care of. But in this study, I'm going to look at how multiple fa factors are interplaying in a complex and interactive way uh, because the gender, water and technology relationships are very complicated. And that's why I'm looking at whether uh, technologies are not value neutral. So science gives, uh, invents technology. So technology is science. And technology is there to make our lives easy, to make quality of life better. But it is pertinent to see how social identity like gender, wealth, patronage, dependency relationship shapes the accessibility of this technology or accessibility of water, which the technology is helping us to get. So and I have these uh, four main objectives or research questions. How has technology addressed the issue of drought and water scarcity in Western Rajasthan? Does modern uh, technology help in mitigating water stress? Has all people in the community equally benefited from modern innovation? Uh, how has the technology adoption affected the gendered roles and cultures surrounding water? So this is a slide where I have given introduction to the study area and uh, here two, three points I want to just focus that 33% of villages in Rajasthan are covered under rural drinking water. And uh, of course, uh, there is a long way to go to achieve the SDG 2030, which is access to affordable, clean water for all. So uh, we can see that in Rajasthan, that's quite low. Uh, and it was also low during the millennium uh, targets. And there is severe problems of water scarcity projected because of climate variability, ex uh, expected increase in erratic per uh, precipitation, average temperature rising, land degradation, desertification. And on top of that, population is ri rising very fast, uh, declining the per capita access to water. So that is a big, big issue. Now, uh, how have I done the research? As I told you, it's, I have taken a mixed method approach to, through both structured questionnaires and qualitative survey, mostly ethnographic fieldwork, focus group discussions. Uh, and uh, I have chosen uh, villages from three districts of Rajasthan, the dry Western district, Jaisalmi, Jodhpur, and Barmer. And I have uh, spotted my villages here. And these, uh, the households have been randomly chosen from the villages, which, uh, and carefully chosen to represent all the communities in the villages, representing all castes and religion. 
And here I will come to the discussions, uh, the findings. First, we see that the that very less percentage of households have access to water at homes. So also according to the census, uh, the last census that only 21% of rural households had drinking water sources within their premises and 47% had very far away. And here also we see that villages, uh, the villages that, uh, we, uh, that, I, that we surveyed, women had to walk one to nine kilometers to fetch water. So water scarce districts are those districts where uh, uh, the water scarcity is there. And uh, but we have to see very interestingly that when we look at where is the source of water, the source of water is very far away. Uh, how? So when we see that because there is uh, more scarcity of water, drier the district, the greater the scarcity, and more is the prevalence of tanker tank, tankers. Uh, th that is a very good. Uh, that's a very obvious correlation, I would say. So the water tankers, uh, there's another thing here I really want to focus is that when we looked at the caste composition as to who buys water, who access the water tankers, very interestingly, it, the technology has been biased because low caste people of the villages in Western Rajasthan are buying less water. And here I've given you a picture, you know, the tankers carry the caste names. And because water in Indian society is tied to the concept of purity and pollution and Rajasthan in interior villages still today, water is not shared among different caste groups. So similarly, even with the advent of technology, which is science for everyone, but technology accessed in a social setup is very different from different caste groups. And clearly, uh, even when sometimes the Dalits had money, the tankers would not sell to them because if they sell it to such customers, then the high caste Hindu customers would not buy from them. So uh, then also I want to uh, focus here is that uh, then what happens? The Dalit women are the ones who will have to walk these one to nine kilometers to fetch water because uh, their households are not able to buy water. Now, another thing was the cost. Then we look the cost uh, in average household would spend around 800 to 1000 per month for buying water and also uh, traditionally uh, the there is a, a overlap between the economic car, economic class and social uh, costs so uh, apparently it was also obvious that the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe households were also the poorer ones so also they did not have much money to access these tankers which were quite uh, expensive and also kinship relationship played a great role in access to this technology. Now, uh, another thing is very, very interesting. The other aspect of uh, the caste thing, then we come to the gender aspect. When we asked people about who is fetching water and who is buying water, interestingly, the men were buying water. This is where I say that gender is made from water or gen technology itself is culture. Because in high caste households, uh, the uh, women do not have access to cash. Mostly men work outside the families and they have the cash. So when water becomes a commercialized product, it is not no longer considered as a domestic good. And hence it goes out from the feminine work, work, uh, workspace. So now buying water, fetching water is in the masculine workspace. That's why men have been buying and fetching water, which used to be traditionally the women's domain. So here, uh, uh, but in the in the low cost households, we see that women are women and men both are fetching water because uh, most of these women have to walk long distance to, to fetch water, and also they work in uh, the field as agricultural laborers, in mostly in uh, the Narega schemes where government gives them minimum wages to work outside because they are very poor families. And we have seen men also helping them to fetch water. Whereas in the high caste households, wherever the tankers are fetching water at the doorsteps, uh, women do not come out because there is a system of veil or we call parda where they, um, they do not interact with males from other households and hence they do not come out even when to fetch water in several households that we have observed. Uh, so uh, there is a great benefit of the technology 
because we can see that women of certain households who are using tankers do not have to walk long distances. Some women do have, uh, uh, you know, expressed concerns that uh, their control over money, their control to form solidarity, because fetching water is not a task. Fetching water in Western Rajasthan is also considered as a way of socializing, as a way of uh, getting, uh, forming social bonds and social capital where women would go out together to fetch water, share about each other's problem. That bond is getting lost. So, and because uh, fetching water is considered as a, uh, you know, a cultural, it's a cultural thing, which they some, especially the well, older women feel that. But the younger women do understand that this is a great benefit and they can use this time, which they were earlier using to carry water into some other gainful activity or maybe to rest and leisure. But nevertheless, we must appreciate that now the women have choice of not going out to do, do this task. So it's definitely it has selectively mitigated water stress because I have said that water being tied to the concept of purity and pollution, even with money, sometimes Dalits are not able to buy water. Do, low cost women are doubly deprived. Well, now because they have to walk to fetch water, lug water, do wage labors because uh, they're very poor. They have to work out to sustain the families and as well have to do household tasks of taking the care of the ch children and the elderly. So new techno water technology is altering cultures. So men without fuss are collecting water and they are seen in participating gender tasks. Uh, here, I will uh, again reiterate that it is not that the gendered roles have reversed, but rather because water is a, now a commercialized good has to be accessed with cash and interacting with men of other households. So women are no longer I would say needed in that task uh, because they are not given uh, access to money of the household. So there is a different kind of uh, gender task reversal. The other thing which uh, was not, uh, uh, I would say was, uh, it, it's, um, uh, it's open-ended research. I mean, further research needs to be done about long-term implications, intervillage scarcity, uh, intergender differential access, spurious water markets, and an abandonment, uh, abandonment of traditional water bodies and water contamination. Because another thing I have noticed that because these high caste rich uh, families are no longer using these common water sources, they have completely now dependent on these tanker technologies. Um, the village common water sources are now getting totally neglected. The older water harvesting structures that has prevailed through generations are deteriorating without maintenance and care because now there is no patronage of these people. And there is this huge problem that because the local water bodies and surface water bodies are drying up, then these women, the Dalit women have to are walking further. They have to walk many, many more miles because the village water sources are drying up uh, due to lack of maintenance, which is leading to extra burden of work. And uh, so the, this is what uh, is about my presentation. I didn't look at the time. Uh, and uh, you know, the, these are some pictures from the field. And uh, yes, I come to an end of my uh, presentation and I will be very happy to answer and share further uh, questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anandita. Thank you for sharing that. You know, it's it's sad that even at this age, when we talk of equality, equity, we still have, have this caste distinctions. But just I just wanted to ask you, in your various survey and study there, did you also see that there were, did you also see where, did you also notice uh, the sources that the women go to are these rivers, are these wells? And if they are, what was the kind of source? And also, was it demarcated as this is for this caste, that is for the other caste? Did you observe things like that in the open source as well? Uh, mostly, there were wells uh, which would be demarcated for uh, low caste people. 
but uh, the Khadins and the other common sources, Bauris, they are actually rainwater harvesting structures. So the tankas, they call it tankas, that each household, they have a tank, underground tank. And they buy water and, you know, everybody uh, locks their tanker, they have the key. So it is, uh, it is uh, a very sacrosanct kind of a thing because water, as I said, um, there is a concept of purity and pollution. They don't share water. And now because they are buying it, it is all the more very precious. So everybody saves water. Sharing of water has never been a common phenomena in Rajasthan ever. But now what I want to uh, reiterate is that because now they're buying it, the technology access is also so limited that is creating further deprivation. And the common ponds where the Dalits are accessing water, uh, they are very dirty. And uh, I, I mean, they, I won't say they are safe water. For safe water, they generally use the streams, which has flowing water, and they have to walk long distances to get that. Yeah. Those, those are common property. Yeah. Uh, you didn't see any alternate options, water harvesting, because the water uh, appears there, I guess. Yes, that's what I'm saying. The water harvesting structures are not taken care because they are uh, they are drying up. There are siltations, so it requires a uh, you know community's work to keep that harvesting structure going. It, is so, there any success models in around in and around those villages and towns? Of uh, at least where we had gone. Uh, there were no successful models of community participation in water harvesting. And, uh, you know, uh, we, this is from a project which we did on uh, climate change and sustainable livelihoods. So uh, when we went to the field, these are the new things that kept on coming. And it was very surprising that the traditional water harvesting structures are not taken care of because water is now easily accessed through tankers and people want it at those steps. Mm -hmm. yeah. Also, I see the other side where I see, you know, going out to fetch water in yes. society is a recreational activity, something for the women folks to come together, talk to, you know, talk about exactly. socialize. With all that, yeah, I think, I think, Technology should not be separating or, you know, uh, bringing inequality in society. But a question to you, are these tankers also owned by private people or is it government? Yes, no, these tankers are totally private. They're all private tankers. They carry water from the nearby stream or the Indira Gandhi Canal. Okay. And, they, um, they procure water from a common source and just give it at the doorstep. That's oh, it. So their rule is only cutting the transport cost. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Right. But it is everybody's water at the end of the day. Exactly. Everybody's water at the end of the day, just that you don't have to carry it to your doorstep. So did you also observe a lot of water mafia in that area then? Uh, till now, uh, not so much. That's why I said that it is going to lead to spurious water markets. Yes. So between the tankers, I did not see that competition. So water mafias do come. Like in urban water markets, water mafias are there because I have my lot of work on uh, water mafias in Africa because I have worked in uh, Nairobi slums. But the water mafias will come when there is competition between the tankers. All right, all right. So I would say the water markets have just started to develop. So once there is competition, yes. So these are, you know, independent private tankers who sell water. So if somebody comes in the business procuring the tankers, you know, monopolizing it, yes, you're right. Then you have water mafias. So, uh... Do you also see any government initiatives where it will be, you know, equal distribution for all? 
Are there uh, any programs by the government in this region, in this area? And if it if it has not, then if there isn't, then why do you think it hasn't reached, you know, those programs haven't reached these regions or these parts of the world? Yes, I have uh, mentioned to you that only 33% of the villages are under the rural drinking water scheme, which is the government scheme, I just mentioned. And only 21% of the households have access to water at home, which is they're getting through the government pipelines. And... Uh, mostly they use the wells and they are so contaminated they're contaminated water so government uh, is trying to give them water through the water pipelines right and through some schemes where they will have uh, government wells but there are instances also when you have a government water source Caste plays a very important role in access to water in such common water sources. Mm. And uh, as of now, the prices are affordable. So when I speak to them uh, and they say that water is coming in our taps only once or twice and the villages in these interior areas do not have government taps. Mm. So they've if they can afford, they would, of course, like to have water at the doorsteps. Yeah, but afford also is a very broad term, you know. For yes, that's what I said. Yeah, only, those huge, rich, yes. yeah, only those rich. So, yeah, only those rich. Yeah, and then there are a lot of questions which are which have come from the audience. Let me just shoot that because we okay. have, and I think I would like to take it here after each speaker. I don't know who this question is from, but they want to know if there are any ancient indigenous water harvesting technique in Rajasthan. Yes, there are lots of, lots of ancient harvesting techniques, okharis, bauris, nadis, khadins. So there are lots and lots of ancient harv water harvesting structures. And uh, there are um, sometimes community participations which help in uh, reviving these. So one of yeah. our recommendation was to revive these water structures. But you know, what I'm trying to question is that if the rich people or the patrons of these water harvesting structures, they are like, you know, so if these people are getting water at the doorstep, as I said, so-called affordable rates, they are not uh, interested in taking up the pain to revive these uh, harvesting structures. So, you know, this is kind structures. of a shortcut. Mm, I know, traditional structures, it's difficult to hold on to them. Exactly. But so, it because is. It's, there is a tragedy of commons that some people say that yeah. if three people are reviving it for 30 people, uh, mm. they don't want to. Traditional knowledge is something which should not be lost. Exactly. So, and you know? it is a common property. But then with easy money to spend and the time taken to build it, I understand. So another question again, I think it did, did answer. I don't know who this question is from again. What engineering and technology you suggest for increasing the water source supply to villagers? Is there oh, sorry, I am not a <laughs> engineer. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I am uh, skilled and equipped to answer this question. And you know, it's not on rains. Yeah, there are lots of rain seeding, cloud seeding events. I mean, experiments going on. But I think it would be more about conservation, being able to conserve the, in order to make it sustainable. Just answering the question here. If the people were able to revive and maintain the traditional systems and also rejuvenate or maintain the water harvesting system, should be one sustainable technology, I feel so. And another question again, who is responsible for denying water to Dalit? What protection and action is needed? Oh, this is a very important question. Although constitutional rights gu guarantees that, you know, untouchability is a criminal offense, but uh, these are cultural and uh, social norms. So I, uh, I, I, I did discuss this that water selling is a business. 
okay but the it is uh, money does not only consider the business so even if you have money you're not buying it because the tankers are here purely for business so mm -hmm. if they start selling it to the dalits if the if their tanker pipes touch the tankers of the dalits then the high caste people will not buy from them mm -hmm. so you know that is why they deny water so uh, it is because of the no cultural notion of purity and pollution because the dalits are in those kinds of work that uh, that those are polluted mm -hmm. so the tankers just because they do not want to lose customers they do not sell so i won't say the tanker owner per se is following casteism a question right. A question. Suppose if there was a millionaire who was in the rank of a Dalit, where would the, you know, where would the game be then? I, I then that that the game will be different. The if anybody wants to uh, purchase water, will purchase. But I also mentioned here that Dalits were the Dalits were also the ones who were poor. So. there will be very few dalits who would be able to afford that price right so in that case uh, even those people will be denied I, I, it's not that 0% dalits are buying water i showed in my table there is still some percentages of dalits who are buying water mm -hmm. they can buy water but there is a problem even if they have money they have to negotiate for the water lovely anandita we will hold on to that thought also we we'll come back because we have another speaker and we would like to hear from manjunath you can stop sharing your slide so manjunath is a phd student and a scholar from icar from the national dairy research institute so from wind to hybrid system of wind and solar to the water problems in rajasthan i think we would like to listen to what manjunath has to say about the climate services for the buffalo farmers and how technology is helping reach out to the end users to community to farmers look forward to that manjunath yes ma'am present am i audible now yes so good afternoon everyone so firstly i feel honored and thankful to iccsr and science council of asia for giving me this opportunity to present my study in front of experts so uh, myself manjunath kv i am a phd scholar in national dairy research institute and i am presenting my topic on climate services for murra buffalo farmers an effective adop uh, adaptation strategy against the climate change so firstly coming to the climate change scenario in india india's average temperature has increased by around 0.7 degree celsius in the last one century and is projected to rise by around 4.4 degree celsius by the end of 21st century manjunath let me stop you there can you share your slide your slides are not moving if you could uh, present it in a presentation mode whether slides are changing hello it is changing yeah then yes. if you could direct sorry if yeah so if you could present it at the bottom of your presentation you go to the screen slide because it's not visible it's or simply you can press f5 it will become the presentation mode whether it is showing now no no it's not the presentation mode still uh, you can stop sharing and you can reshare it again hello yeah this is, is this is better absolutely please go ahead yes yes thank you uh India's uh, summer monsoon precipitation over the India has declined by around six percent from 1951 to uh, 2015, and India have experienced more than two droughts per decade on an average. And the area affected by drought has also increased by 1.3 percent uh, per decade or in the last one century. So 
So at present, 20 to 80 percent of our interannual variability of the crop yields is associated with the weather phenomena, and 5 to 10 percent of the agriculture production losses are associated with the climate variability. And a projected temperature rise of 2 to 6 degrees Celsius over the existing temperatures will affect both milk production as well as the reproductive function of the dairy animals. And the negative impact of the uh, temperature rise on the milk production for India has been estimated around 15 million tons by the year 2050. Uh, since my study is in uh, is on Murra buffalo farmers of Haryana, so let us see how prominent role is this Murra buffalo playing in the state. So out of 6.6 million buffalo population in the state, 5.1 million are Murra buffaloes, which contributes to the 77% of the total buffalo population, having the highest Murra buffalo density among all other states. And 80, around 80% 80 of the total milk production in the state is contributed alone by the Murra buffaloes. And the number of buffaloes per thousand households is 1778, which is three times the national average. And the central part of Haryana is also considered as breeding track of Murra buffaloes. Next coming to so how this climate change is actually affecting the Murra buffaloes. The rise in the uh, maximum temperature during summer, that is heat wave, or fall in the minimum temperature during the winter, that is cold wave, will cause a decline in the milk yield, which will range from 10 to 30 percent in the first lactation and 5 to 20 percent in the second lactation of the Murra buffaloes. And the buffaloes have higher sensitivity to heat stress due to their thick black skin, deeply situated uh, sweat glands, and sparse body hairs. And the frequency of diseases uh, like FMD, septicemia, and tick fever are likely to be increased due to this climate change scenario. In the hot, dry summers, particularly from the March to June, which is uh, widely predominant in the northern part of India, will affect the reproductive performance of the Murra buffaloes. And the milk productivity of the Murra buffaloes will decline by more than 1% per each unit increase in the maximum THI above 82. So this is the climate change scenario of my study area, that is Haryana state we can see the steep increase in the maximum uh, temperature over the years. And also we can see the moderate trend of increase in the mean minimum temperature. And the annual rainfall of Ariana has also shown considerable variation over the decades. And the projection for all these three parameters are in increasing trend, which is quite alarming for the state. So then knowing that the climate change is real and is affecting the Murab of Lowe's, so what could be the next viable option? So the global framework for climate services was established in the year 2009 to enable better management of the risks of climate variability and change and to adaptation to the climate change by development and incorporation of this science-based climate information and prediction into the planning policy and practice. This uh, framework will strengthen the production of these climate services, making the availability of these climate services to the farmer's doorsteps and application of these services in the farmer's day-to-day -day practices. So what is uh, meant by actually a climate service? The climate services can be defined as the decision making support tools which are developed based on the process of transforming, transforming the climate information into relevant advisory services, which will assess the decision making by the individuals and organizations of the society. These climate services will provide the tailored, that means the custom made uh, location specific and the salient that is significant and usable advisories for the vulnerable communities. So the climate services that are available in India. So IMD under Ministry of Earth Sciences uh, started the district level agro meteorological advisory services in the year 2008 with the aim of providing the relevant weather information and management advisories at a district scale across the country. So this program is providing uh, meteorological that is weather forecasting information, agriculture that is how uh, the weather forecast affecting uh, the farming and extension and uh, information dissemination using the various media. So this uh, tailoring information to the farmer's needs at the district level is uh, accomplished through multi-institutional teams at the agro-meteorological field units, which are situated all across the country. So next, adaptive measures that are suggested through the uh, this agro-met advisory bulletins, which are issued for the each districts. So this agro-met advisory bulletins will, uh, uh, will give advisories to the farmers regarding uh, cultiv cultivar selections, choosing their windows for sowing or harvesting operations, irrigation scheduling for optimum water use, mitigation from the adverse uh, weather events like frost, low and high temperatures, etc. The fertilizer applications like dose and time, the pesticides or fungicide or, uh, spraying schedule based on the weather uh, forecast and the feed health and shelter management for also the livestock. So uh, the beneficiaries uh, do, uh, with this agro advisory service are expected to be 21.69 million farmers across the country. 
and the agromet advisories as of uh, presently are covering uh, sectors like crops fruits vegetables livestock water supplies for irrigation and efficient use of the chemicals and the impact is the decreased uh, cultivation cost up to 25% and the increased net returns of farmers up to 83% and economic is benefit, economic benefit is estimated to be around us 7.5 billion dollars per year so these are the few uh, these uh, case studies are uh, the uh, from the uh, uh, benefits uh, beneficiaries of agromet advisory services the former sri narayan uh, by chadwa has, uh, has reported that since 1992 uh, he uh, have been getting this weather advisories uh, every tuesday and friday so this uh, advisories have helped him mainly in planning agriculture activities especially vegetables and cereals and the former sri jayant by uh, tanuk of raipur has reported that uh, he is regularly uh, the user of the weather forecast and agro event advisory services and he is mainly benefited uh, for scheduling the various agriculture operations like fertilizer application spraying of weed sites pesticides drip irrigation etc uh, these are the again few uh, studies uh, which are uh, reported. So Datatra from Maharashtra has uh, uh, reported that uh, he has been using the weather voice alert messages and parameters like thunder showers, rains, uh, uh, which has helped him to protect the harvested soya bean uh, by keeping them in the dry and shade uh, place, due to which uh, there is in increased net income up to thirty five thousand around thirty five thousand. And the former in the Punjab uh, has uh, reported that. Uh, he has inquired about weather because as he wanted to sow the cotton in seven acres and since there was a possibility of the rain uh, there was a rain forecast he was advised not to sow cotton because the germination henio will be affected due to the crust formation so the due to which the farmer saved around seven thousand rupees uh, due to this timely advisories and in the former uh, from himachal pradesh uh, he was also immensely benefited with this voice messages so according to his uh, estimate Around uh, he has saved around twenty percent of the total input cost uh, input cost in the last one year. Uh, these are the few uh, next coming to the few climate services which are being provided to the farmers across the globe. So ICRISAT, uh, a study uh, in Kenya has found, has found that the farmers are highly benefited with the climate services, which has enabled them for more input use, uh, more efficient input use, and improved yields. And uh, Rathor and Chetopadeya uh, in their study across the India has found that the agromet services uh, of IMD has helped the farmers to maximize their output and also uh, minimize their crop damage or loss. And these advisories have helped the farmers uh, to anticipate and uh, plan for various uh, chemical operations like chemical applications, irrigation scheduling, etc. And again, a study by uh, Chetopadeya and Chandras. Uh, uh, has found that around 20 to 25% of the economic benefit is obtained due to this adoption of the advisory services. And the group read at all in their 100 kilometer range from the IRI Institute, New Delhi, has found that the wheat farmers were able to reduce the input cost and uh, increase their net profit. And at all, at all, in the study in Uganda, has reported that the farmers use these weather advisories 3.4 times, and due to which they have uh, mainly these farmers have used information. Uh, when uh, during uh, making decisions regarding when to plant their crops and how to manage them. So this is the locale of my study, uh, the central part of Haryana. So here right side we can see in the green part, uh, which is uh, central part of Haryana, which is called as the breeding track of Murra Buffalo has been uh, selected. And so weekly, uh, the climate services will be uh, prepared uh, for the Murra Buffalo farmers. So the weekly module on the climate information and related advisories uh, on Murra Buffalo rearing and crop cultivation are prepared. So the climate information and parameters like, sorry, uh, rainfall, maximum temperature, minimum temperature, relative humidity, wind speed and direction, cloud cover, weather alerts, these all parameters will be uh, assessed from the IMD agrometrology. And based on these uh, weather uh, forecasting parameters, we'll prepare the weekly uh, advisories. So Murra Buffalo advisories will be prepared by the team. So, and we are also the agromet bulletin of the Isar Agriculture University, which, will, which is containing the crop specific advisory we are collecting and advisories on major crops for the study area are prepared. So, and we have divided the farmers into two groups. One is the experimental group and the control group. So, the under uh, farmers of the experimental group are those uh, from the experimental villages to whom we will disseminate this weekly module on climate information as well as advisories. Whereas uh, for the control group farmers, uh, we are not disseminating these uh, advisories. So these advisories uh, will be disseminated to the farmers in the uh, three following modes, SMS services uh, to the farmers and the mobile based application, which we have uh, developed exclusively for the present study. And also the uh, third one is the WhatsApp mode. 
so for the experimental uh, group uh, as well as control group there will be an pre test so after which we will give this intervention uh, we are giving this intervention only for the experimental group and after which we will measure uh, both uh, for experimental and control group after the completion of the intervention so this is the research design which i am using for my study the difference in difference research design so here in the right side in the graph we can see so d0 and c0 are the outputs of treatment and control group respectively before starting the intervention so here on this vertical line is where that we have started the treatment and again on d1 and c1 are the outputs of treatment group and control group after the completion of intervention so we'll subtract this output of uh, both the groups and uh, after intervention minus uh, outputs of the both the group before intervention which to give to, uh, to give, uh, give an estimate of a uh, true impact of this advisory services so this is the glimpses of uh, the mobile application uh, which i have developed uh, for my study so this is the welcome and registration screen and this is the uh, dashboard and prime content of the mobile app so and again here we can see the left side this all the weather parameters for the one week and the uh, next uh, like uh, uh, general information regarding climate resilient practices advisories etc so next uh, this, this is the former response on the effectiveness of the climate services which we have disseminated already uh, disseminating uh, to the farmers so this the respondent name is the sushil kumar so his locality is bebalpur village uh, in the barwala block of isar district in the haryana state so he is growing the crops wheat paddy and cotton so and he is also having the five mura buffaloes so during our intervention how the farmer has, uh, has also perceived the, that the climate is changing to which he has ascribed to the increasing summer temperatures decreasing winter temperatures and unseasonal rainfall patterns over the years and due to which this uh, this is causing a negative effects on the crop and livestock productivity so the farmer has also reported that the agromet advisory services of hiu isar agriculture university is already helping him uh, immensely in uh, making operational decisions related to his crops from sowing to till harvesting so which has reduced his input costs and also increased the yields and he has also opinioned that the weekly climate services exclusively for the murra buffaloes which we are disseminating is greatly assisting in day to day operations and maintaining their productivity amid the climate change scenario which were previously lacking which signifies the importance and prominent role of the climate services in the livestock sector apart from also the crop farming so coming to the conclusion so the tailor made that is location specific uh, climate services uh, for the farmers may be the panacea for the climate sensitive murra buffalo rearing for sustainable production in the country in the coming decades thank you thank you very much manjunar thank you like this is a very preliminary study that you've been carrying on the on the buffalo community yes ma'am yeah just wanted to know you know like even i have seen i have also witnessed and documented various uh, you know problems faced by the yaks in the mountain region as well yes, yes. even a 1 degree celsius is very high for them yes ma'am rare or even you know for the pastures to also grow yes ma'am there have been debates concerns and also talks about hybrids yes ma'am but at one you do want to preserve the local breeds also yes, is there a kind of alternate to buffaloes that has been with you know is there some kind of research going on yes, at ar or your institution yes, that to hybrid uh, varieties of buffalo who can be more resistant to climate change yes ma'am um, actually the buffaloes is considered has the highest uh, resilient uh, we can say the livestock species uh, compared to the hybrid hybrid uh, for whatever uh, hf or jersey cows compared to especially in this northern part which will express uh, which will witness the severe humidity uh, especially for our, what uh, from four months so the buffaloes will serve as an effective uh, uh, this one uh, compared to the hybrid as of the present scenario in the uh, north part of the india is concerned oh you mean to say the locals are more resistant than the hybrid yeah, yes we have done this uh, one part of the study is also we have conducted a study that which uh, breeds of the farmers would be like to uh, you know prefer to rear so they were telling that uh, we, they have tried uh, keeping uh, hf and jersey cows 
but due to this high humid and uh, extreme winter situations they were unable to cope so the buffaloes were more uh, you know resilient compared to this uh, breeds so they have again switched back to this uh, mura buffaloes okay manjuna so also can you explain how if in case there is climate service to help the farmers you know rear their buffaloes or to help them co- cope with climate because it's a very short span it's a very short time interval you know where you'll have to make quick decisions so how do you factor the the time loss in this you know between sending the information to allowing the farmers to prepare for the buffalo herds or the buffalo you know the group yes to go to you know to to kind of adapt to the changing weather actually that's not normal every week so as of now this is the only uh, that one imd indian meteorological department is uh, as of now they are giving the data they are giving only weekly forecast weekly forecast so based on which the crop advisor is also prepared only once in a week so for one so week you mean is it the fodder no my uh, crops of paddy or wheat location i am talking about uh, how would you preserve conserve or make the buffaloes healthier generally the changing say. climate you know yes ma'am the reserve for them are the farmers keeping some kind of a fodder reserve yes yes like we'll advise in every aspect right from the management to fodder to their reproductive health to their nutrition so on every aspect we will cover entire like package every week every week according to the weather like this could be the, the for this is the forecast for your district in the next week that you may witness this uh, th uh, the temperature humidity index above 83 so that you will fo- formulate this ration of mixture to feed the buffaloes so give three times of cold water for drinking so enable okay. them to uh, you know bath with a cold water so this kind of advisory is from uh, fodder to nutrition every aspect will give them weekly all right manjuna and then i just wanted to know also are there any kind of new diseases that you see coming up in the buffaloes which were not heard of before or is there some kind of you know emerging diseases because of the the change in climate the climate uh, changes as the studies have reported like uh, for fmd foot and mouth disease and septicemia are likely to be increased but this haryana state government is having a very good veterinary infrastructure uh, right from up to grassroots level where they are vaccinating this murra buffaloes once uh, twice in a year twice in a year uh, for fmd as well as uh, hs so the farmers have reported that so we are getting 6 months once in a vaccination so that disease prevalence is now reduced if we skip by means if the some farmers are skipping they are again uh, their buffaloes are getting uh, susceptible to that disease okay so there is a good vet service yeah yes good vet service this is a good news also another question with regard to the climate services for the farmers yes ma'am this is a question to you because you've been working on the ground and as a researcher yes ma'am uh do you think all farmers are ready to listen to the advice sent by the climate experts or through the climate services are they open to receiving these kind of information and how many of them are against it so like uh, mo- mo- most of the farmers have been already acclimatized with these services because since from the 2008 they are already you know getting this majority of the farmers you could say they are getting this advisories from the imd for crops ma'am for crops they have imd has started since from the 2008 itself and also the veterinary infrastructure as i said in haryana is too strong at every village the veterinary staff is too good like uh, veterinary officers to veterinary clerks are there so farmers are already approaching them they are taking that advice so uh, when we approached it become too too easy for us to you know go through the veterinary officers and all so farmers are very responsive till now okay so it's it's door to door to the farmers trying to take their numbers getting them registered building up the the list is that how you all are doing it now yes i mean uh, we are selecting oh, uh, we are selecting from each village we are just selecting uh, 20 farmers randomly okay okay ah uh, nice yes. okay. not the thank you so much thank you so much manjunal thank you thank you okay you know very interesting to see that even the buffalo community is also taking care of the technology 
Thank you. It's also open to the climate services. Thank you. I think there is a question in the chat box. Okay, I don't know who this is from, but yeah, could it, it's to you, Manjunath. Could you yes, give a comparison of buffalo in India and other country milk product ratio and its clinical effect? Can you see the question? Uh, could you give the comparison of buffalo in India and other country also milk production ratio and its clinical? So I could uh, at this point I am unable to like you know I don't know these other countries uh, what buffalo is contributing. But as far as India is concerned, not just in Haryana, the all other parts we can say the buffalo is the highest contributor uh, to the milk production in India. Highest contributor from in India, the milk production is coming from the buffaloes, and that too the ninety percent of the Haryana rural economy is dependent on the. Mura buffaloes here. So okay. it is prominent role that they, it is playing as far as in India is concerned. There is a question with regard to in the Kashmir belt, can you name the clone species that can be read in Kashmir? Are buffaloes, can buffaloes be read in a cold climate? I do not know. Manjunath, can they? Yes, yes, they, they, they can be grown. They, they're, uh, they're highly sensitive because of their block uh, body structure and uh, rarely spaced uh, sweat glands. As I said, they're more sensitivity to uh, heat than the cold, than it is being too cold. So they, they, they definitely can be raised, uh, but I don't it know. Because in the Himalayan belt, I haven't seen any buffaloes. E extreme, extreme again, extreme, uh, we cannot say extreme. We can And also, as uh, we have witnessed in the uh, field study, the milk production, the farmers have reported high milk uh, dip in the summer season compared to the winter. Again, the buffaloes are also prone to this disease, as what I said, FMD septicemia, more likely in the yeah. summer. Manjunath, you're talking in terms of the cold uh, winter months in Haryana, right? Yes. yes, yes, yes. I am talking about rearing buffaloes in a cold climatic zone. Like, yeah, Kashmir will again be uh, again be very much uh, not much difficult. Yes, yeah, it will be difficult uh, as far as uh, the uh, yeah. study uh, experiences from our study because in Haryana is also they are facing slight difficulty in winter during extreme yeah. winter. So considering that, it will be uh, difficult to rear sustainably in the Kashmir region. So yeah, so my answer to the person who was asking this question, I think, would be. Maybe clone species of cows or yaks or donkeys milk, but I don't think the buffalo is possible in the in the Kashmir belt. I, I may not be sure, but this is what I've observed and seen. Yes, yes. Any other question? I would like to also call all the speakers together. If you if the speakers have any question for your co-speakers, please feel free to ask because we have 10 minutes. If not, then we can end this uh, very interesting dialogue between, between the speakers from water to buffalo. So if not, then I think, yeah, Dr. Wood is also here. If there are no yeah. questions, yeah. Do you have any questions, Dr. Wood or Arandita? If not, then I think we can end this and we'll see you again in the next session. Thank you yeah. so much. For engaging, it was a uh, it was a joy to listen to all of you. Yes, thank uh, you. Many new, many new and many old faces as well. Yeah, thank you so much, Nitin, also for organizing. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And my heartfelt thank to all the presenters for presenting their research. I hope that these researches will help in making this earth a better place to live. I'm also thankful to Dr. Smithy for sparing time to chair the session and sharing her valuable thoughts. Thank you very much. With this, we come to the end of day one of the conference. I hope that it proved to be fruitful in terms of learning and added value to all of us. Once again, on behalf of Indian Council of Social Science Research, I thank all the participants, presenters, and session, session chairs. See you tomorrow at 10 a.m. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.